welcome to another edition of When the Spirit Takes Over. Here we analyse aspects of human consciousness which appears to exist outside the familiar constraints of time and space. A potential of spirit which appears to take over as we cross from one realm into another. The philosophical concept of karma, which is thought to have originated from various schools of Indian religious philosophy, regard it as a spiritual principle of cause and effect, where both a person's actions and intentions cause have an influence on their future effect. The earliest reference to the concept of karma appears in the Rig Veda, ancient Indian collection of Vedic Sanskrit hymns, 1500 BC. This limited example is later expanded upon in the Upanishads, late Vedic Sanskrit texts. South Asian traditions differ from Abrahamic religions as their laws of karma act outside the judgment of the divine creator. Whether these karmic repercussions take place during a person's immediate life or a future lifetime is all part of nature's way of keeping its energetic equilibrium in balance. The principle of what goes around comes around is tied in with reincarnation, because without alternative dimensions and ways to express this karma, it would have to manifest balance during one lifetime, which, as we all know, does not always happen. Consequently, if a person performs good deeds and intentions during their lifetime, they will essentially gain karmic credits and move upwards in conscious development. However, if their lives were corrupted by bad actions and intentions, their credit score would diminish, sending them down towards lower forms of conscious awareness, like a perpetual game of snakes and ladders. If, however, a person accidentally or unwittingly caused harm towards another, overwhelming them with remorse, compassion and regret, their karmic credits should not be affected. But those whose minds are filled with evil intent, who hardly ever act out their thoughts, are more likely to be karmically affected. Due to differing opinions concerning the specifics of karma throughout various religions and schools of philosophy, a defined concise meaning of the term has not entirely been established, as it has slightly different meanings within various groups. However, the basic principle is the same, being nature's way of balancing good and bad energy throughout the universe, working independently of any deity or divine judgment. With every action, emotion or thought, energy is emitted which is either good or bad. These actions or intentions essentially produce seeds which will germinate some time within nature's balancing system. Although actions are important, the attitude of the intention makes all the difference. A soldier obeying orders from his superiors 
who also, in turn, follow orders in a chain of command, resulting in the minds of the subordinate soldiers being propagandized into fighting what they consider to be a good war. They will likely have to fight soldiers on the opposing side of a similar age who also believe that they are defending and upholding their country's sound principles, pressured into killing one another because their superiors tell them to. The impact on the soldier's karma will greatly depend upon what he is thinking at the moment he fires the shot. This used to be a problem in early conflicts of the 20th century. However, the modern soldier is trained to be an emotionless killing machine who does not let thinking get in the way of his task. Their training teaches them to operate on instinct, without having to engage any form of moral cognitive discourse. The corporate world of the modern military-industrial complex has compartmentalized each person's role in order to remove moral consequence from the equation. They are all essentially following orders. So how does this affect their karmic standing? To simplify the concept of karma, it can be broken down into four different types. Sanchita karma, accumulated karma, quiver of arrows. This is the store of accumulated karma from all other previous lives, which become seeds waiting for the appropriate time to germinate. It is thought by many scholars on this subject, that only when this karma is balanced to a point of neutrality that the soul can retire, leaving the spirit aspect of consciousness to continue in a state of enlightenment towards nirvana. Prarabuddha karma, arrow in flight. This is a specific part of a person's karmic debt which is being dealt with during their latest incarnation. When analyzing a person's astrological birth chart or performing various forms of divination, it is this aspect of karma which can be identified. While the Sanchita karma can be compared to a quiver of arrows stored on a person's back, the Prarabuddha karma would be the arrow in flight which has just left the bow. Kriyamana karma, instant karma. This is considered to be instant karma generated from this lifetime due to the actions and intentions of our free will. Although some Kriyamana karma brings relatively instant karma, of either justice or gifts. Others are stored for future rebirths. Therefore, Kriyamana karma is divided into two types. 1. Arabuddha karma undertaken. 2. Anarabuddha karma dormant or stored. To understand these two types of Kriyamana karma, a good example would be a situation where two people commit a robbery, only one of them gets caught and sent to jail. Arabuddha karma. However, the other robber continues his life where sometime in the future he experiences an Arabuddha karma. Agami karma. This is considered to be the accumulative karma created during this present life, which, if unresolved, before we die, 
crosses over into future rebirths. The concept of the archer to describe the various types of karma is an ancient one, which still helps to clarify the different types of karma to this day. The archer has already sent an arrow, and it has left his hands. He cannot recall it. He is about to shoot another arrow. The bundle of arrows in the quiver on his back is the Sanchita Karma. The arrow he has shot is Prarabuddha Karma, and the arrow which he is about to shoot from his bow is Kriyamana Karma. The result of the arrow that he is about to shoot is the Agami Karma, Vedic literature. Not even death can wipe out good deeds, Buddha. If you give a good thing to the world, then over time your karma will be good and you'll receive good. Russell Simmons Men are not punished for their sins, but by them. Albert Hubbard Karma comes after everyone eventually. You can't get away with screwing people over your whole life. I don't care who you are. What goes around comes around. That's how it works. Sooner or later, the universe will serve you the revenge that you deserve. Jessica Brody Realize that everything connects to everything else. Leonardo da Vinci Don't waste time on revenge. The people who hurt you will eventually face their own karma. No need for revenge. Just sit back and wait. Those who hurt you will eventually screw up themselves. And if you're lucky, God will let you watch. One who previously made bad karma, but who reforms and creates good karma, brightens the world like the moon appearing from behind a cloud. Buddha. Karma can be divided up into another three basic types. Physical, activities of the body. Verbal, actions of the mouth. And mental, activities of the mind and will. The law of karma, which goes around comes around, is as real as Newton's third law of motion, in which he states, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This is all part of nature's balancing act, in which we as individuals or as collectives play our part influencing things. In Buddhism, it is important that thoughts, words and deeds correspond with one another in a constant manner. There is also individual karma and common karma. In the latter, all people within a group or nation can share in the causes and effects, good or bad, leading to either social improvements or national disasters. Whoever rules the group or nation has a responsibility to those being governed. According to the Manu Samhita, an ancient legal text and constitution among many Dharma Sastras of Hinduism, the king receives one-sixth of the collective karma of those he rules over. It is therefore in the king's interest to treat his subjects well and to benefit from the good karma generated. A king who duly protects his subjects receives from each and all the sixth part of their spiritual merit. If he does not protect them, the sixth part of their demerit also will fall upon him. Manu Samhita Chapter 8 A king who does not afford protection, yet takes his share in kind, his taxes, tolls and duties, daily presents and fines, will after death 
soon sink into hell. They declare that a king who affords no protection, yet receives the sixth part of the produce, takes upon himself all the foulness of his whole people. Know that a king who heeds not the rules of the law, who is an atheist and rapacious, who does not protect his subjects, but devours them, will sink low after death. Throughout history, many civilizations, kingdoms and regimes have met their final doom and collapse at a time when things appeared to be stable and prosperous. Yet, nevertheless, some of these decadent societies deteriorated rapidly and unexpectedly. Although these collapsing societies appeared to happen without warning by many who witnessed them they were not entirely unexpected by those who understood the universal law of karma certain aspects of society along with its cultural and moral coordinates have the potential to manifest a significant karmic reaction the Roman Empire is a good example of a civilization which collapsed under its own karmic retribution. During its final stages, egotism and selfishness plagued its ruling classes together with a greater discrepancy and inequality between the rich and poor. Many of Rome's citizens became repulsed by the vulgar extravagance displayed by the very wealthy. Furthermore, they had also developed a widespread obsession with all forms of deviant and perverted sex. The city of Pompeii 
was itself a huge resort of this kind of licentious living and sex as history tells us the city was buried under tons of volcanic ash from the eruption of mount vesuvius in 79 a.d pompey is believed to have had around 25 brothels price lists indicate that prostitution services were generally cheaper in pompeii than other parts of the roman empire on one of the city's central meeting hall walls was the following text if you are looking for sweet embraces in this town you will find that all the girls here are available graffiti attests to homosexuality and even to child rape the simple evidence shows that in their heyday pompeii and herculaneum were indeed a veritable reincarnation of sodom and gomorrah the evidence further indicates that their destruction represented divine punishment when considering the actions and policies of modern nations some appear to have developed sophisticated ways of dispensing karmic retribution as a way of safeguarding their survival however although sophisticated tactics are used i suspect this cannot cover all eventualities and sometime in the future those nations who have imposed their will through force and manipulation resulting in the deaths and suffering of innocent lives will eventually receive a certain amount of karmic payback since a person's mindset and intentions play a vital role in their karmic tally when taking any form of action throughout their lives it is essential for the governing classes to ensure that the mindset of its subjects do not suffer from a conflict of interest towards the country's overall objectives by compartmentalizing almost all aspects of society modern nations partially protect themselves and their subjects from a karmic backlash as most people follow orders from their superiors believing them to be honest and sincere reflecting altruistic aims at the very heart of policy in this way public servants are able to perform their duty instinctively without questioning their moral stance another mechanism at play is the contract as almost all organizations and institutions are now run as corporations the contract is used to relinquish a great deal of karmic backlash by expressing all of its terms and conditions in writing before initiating any venture although most individuals do not read government papers regarding future policy or the small print on most contracts just the action of signing has an impact on the distribution of karma as the government or corporation takes advantage of you government structures are designed in such a way as to appear to endorse rule by consent and the sheer act of voting legitimizes most of their actions however governments have a reputation for duplicitous and deceitful behavior as they look after their own interests first concealing their true intentions and secret operations from public scrutiny any moral dubious action governments undertake no matter what methods are employed to counteract the karmic backlash the laws governing the distribution of karma will ultimately find them out and eventually even out the score the british empire is a good example of this 
as it has a long history of imposing its will upon other people around the world. While on one hand the British Empire attempted to export its version of order, control and prosperity to some of the most remote places on earth, the vast majority of people who were affected by these impositions did not consent and did not want these new powerful rulers. During Britain's colonial expansion, many indigenous cultures suffered cruelty under their new overlords. People who, at that time, appeared basic and savage-like to the colonialists, but were still part of nature and cousins of the human race. Thousands perished prematurely and therefore have some karmic claim against the British establishment and those who, although following orders, inflicted unnecessary suffering on untold numbers. How this karma will play out upon the British establishment and its people is hard to predict. However, if the nation alters its actions and intentions towards others, it may have a chance at internally resolving some of its karmic baggage. Its recent intervention in the Middle East and other aspirations towards globalization suggest it is still up to its old tricks and may therefore be subjected to nature's karmic wrath. The British Empire's obsession at promoting the total destruction of Germany during the first half of the 20th century, which ultimately cost the lives of millions, eventually led to the fragmentation and bankruptcy of its empire. A war which many consider to have been unnecessary, especially to the level at which it consumed the whole of Europe and involved almost the entire world. As a result, Britain lost many of its colonies to independence. It lost its financial dominance as the world's reserve currency and suffered domestic hardship with food rationing for years afterwards. Although this could be considered as instant karma, the depth of trauma caused to millions of people on both sides will no doubt have a karmic backlash which will go on for generations. Thailand, on the other hand, appears to have taken their karmic footprint more seriously than some of those old colonial countries, which are now only a shadow of their former selves. The Thai king is rumoured to be the richest monarch on the planet. The country also managed to keep itself relatively neutral throughout the colonial years of the past two centuries. The majority of Thai people throughout the country are very proactive at trying to keep a good karmic balance during their day-to-day -day activities with regular visits to temples and spirit houses, while also respecting nature's moon phases and cycles. The overall energy and atmosphere in Thailand appears and feels different to that of the United Kingdom and other old European nations. And as a person who has spent many years in both the United Kingdom and Thailand, I suspect, due to its karmic credits, Thailand may inherit a more fruitful, balanced and happier future than most of those now living in what was once known as Great Britain. Any country which deviates from a sense of moral duty towards one another has the potential to sink further into moral degradation, a situation which could escalate promoting a snowball effect regarding bad karma. It is therefore important to give good moral counsel and support 
to each new generation, setting a good standard by example. Examples of Karma An experienced trophy hunter died after being crushed to death by an elephant he was tracking down to kill in Zimbabwe. Professional game hunter Ian Gibson was taken down and crushed by a young elephant while he was leading a hunt for them. Reports from the safari indicate Gibson had already killed a mother leopard during the hunt and boasted about his superiority over the animal kingdom. 55-year-old Billy Ray Harris was homeless. He lived on a street corner in Kansas City, holding out a cup and asking passers-by for spare change. But then, one day, his life changed. Sarah Darling passed Harris at his usual spot and dropped some change into his cup. But unbeknown to her, she also accidentally dropped her engagement ring. Though Harris considered selling the ring, he got it appraised for $4,000. He ultimately couldn't go through with it. And a few days later, he returned the ring to Darling. As a way to say thank you, Darling and her husband Bill started a fund to raise money for Harris to help him get his life back on track. The fund raised far more money than any of them expected. In just three months, people donated more than $190,000. When Roger Lozier was four years old, he wandered away from his mother during a trip to the beach in 1965. He made his way alone into the water and tried to swim. But an undercurrent pulled him down. He would have died, but a stranger named Alice Blaze dove into the water and pulled him to shore, where she revived him and saved his life. Nine years later, 13-year-old Roger was out on the same beach when he heard a woman scream, My husband is drowning. Roger didn't realize this was a woman he'd met before, but he rushed into action anyway. He jumped onto an inflatable raft, paddled out to the man, and pulled him on, saving his life. Nobody there realized the strange cosmic coincidence that had just happened until the news reported on it the next day. It wasn't until then that Alice Blaze realized that the young man who had saved her husband's life was the four-year-old boy whose life she'd once saved. Importance of Forgiveness The ability to forgive others is all part of the Enlightenment process. It is a way to diffuse the escalation of destructive energy which has the potential to get out of hand. Forgiving people of their transgressions towards you allows you to keep a calm temperament, protecting a balanced state of mind. And as our thoughts are related to our mind's intentions, any negative sentiments towards others has the potential to create bad karma. The need for revenge is a base instinct, an animalistic trait which forms part of a lower basic reaction to many situations, especially among the uneducated and weak-willed. As humans, we try to rise above these animal instincts in an attempt to elevate our awareness to higher levels of consciousness and without the ability to forgive, this type of vengeful baggage will only hold an individual back on their path to enlightenment. Holding on to anger is like grasping at a hot coal with the intent 
of throwing it at someone else. You are the one who gets burned, Buddha. When you hold resentment towards another, you are bound to that person or condition by an emotional link that is stronger than steel. Forgiveness is the only way to dissolve that link and get free. Catherine Ponder Without forgiveness, life is governed by an endless cycle of resentment and retaliation. Roberto Asagiolo Another method is to consider the fact that the opponent in former rebirths have been a near relation of oneself, Buddha. There are basically two aspects to forgiveness. The focal mind's awareness of the situation and the emotional aspect of the transgression. Both need resolving in order for the healing process to start and for forgiveness to unfold. First, the conscious mind must make the decision to initiate the forgiveness process which then allows the subconscious emotional part of the mind to heal, which may take some time. As each flashing memory of the indiscretion presents itself, only if that seed is not fed will it perish, and over time the emotional scars created will heal. But he who waters the seeds of bitterness and resentment will never be free from the torment harboured. Forgiveness is a process in which the student acts as a fireman dampening any embers left after the initial fire. Only when the mind is free from base instincts can it travel to higher realms. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Matthew 6.15 Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Proverbs 17.9 A society operates on a compartmentalized basis. The majority of people going about their business are unaware of the bigger picture or the true intentions of those who lead them. For this reason, many who impose the will of the state on others are ignorant to some of the state's overriding sinister ulterior motives and objectives. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing.